All right, good morning, everyone. This open meeting of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee is convening by video conference pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. Thank you to the state government for extending the remote participation uh, authorization. This meeting is being recorded and all attendees are participating remotely via Zoom. The meeting link is included in the agenda posted on the town's website. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. Please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to share your device's screen. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please silence all phones and devices. Members of the public wishing to participate in the meeting must use their full name for Zoom access. If full names are not used, people will not be allowed to participate in the discussion. The town reserves the right to remove any member of the public from the meeting who doesn't use a full name or who acts inappropriately. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. After members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. You can use the raise hand feature in Zoom to indicate you'd like to offer a comment. If you're not able to participate in the remote meeting, you may also submit comments to the Coastal Resilience Coordinator, Leah Hill, to be read into the meeting record. Her email is lhill at nantucket-ma.gov. Uh, I am Ma Mary Longacre, Chair of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members in person have anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Gary Beller. Here. Sarah Boyce. Here. And welcoming Carl Borchert, our new representative from the Planning Board. Here. Peter Brace. Here. Matt Fee. Here. I don't see Rachel Freeman. Uh, Ian Golding. Here. Ken Carber. Here. I don't see Christy Kickham or Joanna Roach at this point. And I think I got everybody. Um, so if uh, someone else joins, we will note that. Um, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Leah Hill. Here. Vince Murphy. Also here. <laughs> and we are not anticipating any speakers today on the agenda. Um, Rachel is just joining us. So we'll wait a second for Rachel to get connected. Uh, and all votes taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Rachel, um, not quite there yet. Can you say hello? Good morning, Rachel. Hello, good morning. All right, um, the agenda, just a note that we have the minutes from February 14th that were received yesterday. Um, so we may not have had enough time to review those. Uh, I will ask the members what their preference is when we get to that item on the agenda. We do not have the minutes from March available. So um, just a change to the agenda. Um, Updates and announcements. So as I mentioned, uh, Joe Topham had resigned from the our, from being our planning board rep to the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee, and we are happy to welcome Carl Borchard in his place. Thank you for joining us, Carl. Uh, good to be here. Thank you. The uh, other announcements, the uh, IPCC has released their synthesis report for the sixth assessment. I believe that concludes the work that they are doing as part of this assessment. We have a link in the agenda for that report if anyone would want to review it. I uh, see Joanna Roach has joined us. Can you say hello, Joanna? Hello. Thank you. Um, and another announcement, uh, training sessions for the Massachusetts Coastal Flood Risk Model, the MCFRM, are being offered by CZM. There's contact information in the agenda. That first session is today at one o'clock. So if anybody is interested in that, that is looking at the basic outputs that can be gained from the MCFRM tool. And just a reminder, we do have that data integrated into the town's GIS website. So it is available to the public to uh, look at the results for the predicted coastal uh, flooding risks. Uh, next item on agenda is our first quarter report to the select board. Leah, could you go ahead and share your screen? And so uh, every quarter we report to the select board on the activities of the previous quarter. And um, uh, uh, following Matt's suggestion, we tried to make this a little more visual and less uh, text-based. Um, so we've created this report in PowerPoint. Uh, Leah has turned it into a PDF, but um, we wanna just briefly scroll through this, Leah. So we have our cover sheet. 
um, highlights from the quarter. So the announcement that Leah Hill was hired as the Coastal Dance Coordinator and uh, the connection with the Provincetown Planner. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, the presentation from uh, Niles Parker at the NHA, and so links to both the WPI student project. And then we also put in links to the recording um, of that particular presentation in the CRAC meeting. And so that uh, hopefully will lead the public to um, take a look at those meeting recordings if they're interested in that presentation. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, Leah. Uh, the presentation from the Land Bank on Washington Street. Um, keep going. The presentation from Acclimate on the Coastal Resilience Walk. Uh, keep going. The presentation from Morgan Sale on the uh, erosion, particularly highlighting the sewer beds and the change there. And so that has the link to the town's website where that project is updated. Go ahead, Leah. And then a couple of pages on the Coastal Resilience Plan and the status of the various recommendations. You can go ahead and scroll through those. And on the final slide here, um, we have the question that we've always had, are there current or upcoming issues for which the select board would like our advice? Um, and then I put an announcement of our regular meeting schedule and Leah's contact information and our uh, recommendation to the select board regarding sea level rise. So those are uh, resources for the public and just thinking that we'll take advantage of the exposure at the select board to make those available to people. Um, and then uh, one more slide there, Leah, or is that, that's our, sorry, that's our next um, uh, item. So that, that was the, uh, actually let's, let's just briefly scroll through that. So that's on the screen. So the Massachusetts Coastal Flood Risk Model, there is a handout in the packet about that model and what it does. Um, so that is available to people, especially if they're not uh, able to take the training this afternoon. So I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, okay, so thoughts um, on the report from the committee members. I hope everybody had a chance to review that. Are there items that you would want to edit, remove, or add? Gary? Well, uh, when I looked at that, I said, you know, contrary to the previous reports, which used to be a dry kind of Remember, we try to keep it to one or two pages. I think this is a terrific report. And the question I have is, um, I, I personally will, once we approve it, will want to make sure that the members of my committee, uh, it's no longer my committee, but I'm still on the, uh, the advisory committee for non-voting taxpayers, uh, see a copy of it. Uh, and I think the public would benefit from this as well. So. How is it that they will have access to that? We will send this to the select board. And do you, do you suppose that the select board is going to uh, spend any time on it? Or is it just going to be part of the minutes of the select board meeting? How do you think that it will become available to the public? Because it's a really wonderful example of all of the stuff that uh, we've been working on. And people can see that. Uh, these meetings really have produced some interesting uh, results and observations. Thank you, Gary. Uh, so yes, it is part of the select board's packet for the meeting. Uh, so it'll be included in the download on the town's website. And we do have the opportunity, um, uh, usually it's been Vince and I, in the future it'll be Leah and I, to present this uh, and do a quick run through such as I just did here today. So it will be captured in the recording of the select board meeting um, as a presentation as well. Uh, Matt has a hand up. Yeah, no, I wanna say the same thing. I think it looks great. And I think, uh, I, I love the pictures. You know, a lot of us select board members, we don't read great. <laughs> I'm kidding. But seriously, the pictures are great. I think it'll make it more uh, user-friendly. I also think once, if there are things you know, not for this report, but as we go, if there are uh, sort of uh, actions we want to see happen elsewhere, you know, if we say, geez, we really need to start working on X, Y, or Z, I think we can highlight that in this report. You know, if there's another department or there's the select board need to, add, you know, need, we need something, I think we put it in there and then we ask again three months later. You know, so some of the things that we have on our, you know, some of the 40 items 
Some of those are supposed to be done relatively soon, but they don't necessarily involve us. But I think this is a great way to say, hey, we've sent a letter to X, Y, and Z, and we're willing to work with them. We'd like to move this along. I, I think this gives us the ability to do that. And maybe at some point there'll be a, you know, a friend of crack list or something else. So people don't have to go into the, you know, they can go online and probably find this on, you know, on the website, but maybe there's, you know, people will sign up for a list or something and get it on a regular basis. Or maybe we send it out to, you know, sort of the newspaper or to uh, the current or something on a regular basis. So I think it's great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, yes, I, I realized once we started creating this, that it this is an excellent opportunity for public outreach and education. Um, so those are some great ideas. Vince? You're on mute? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so just to give everyone just a tiny piece of history, um, uh, Leah and I put the, the standard copy together, which is about page or there, thereabouts. And uh, we just did the normal text version, uh, the dry old version, and everybody loves a good upgrade, but we can't claim this one for ourselves. Uh, credit where credit is due, Mary made this presentation and it is a significant improvement over what we had been doing and it just looks wonderful. Thank you, Vince. Uh, I, I will not be making all of these in the future. This was an experiment and uh, if well received, I hope that Leah will be able to duplicate it or, or surpass it. <laughs> Uh, so comments about the content of the report that we're sending to the select board. Any edits, uh, anything that we left out? If there are no comments, does someone want to make a motion to approve this? Sure, I'll be glad to make the motion, Mary. Thank you, Gary. Do we have a second, Joanne, for a second? Uh, roll call vote. Gary Beller? Aye. Our Boyce? Aye. Our Borchard? Aye. Peter Brace? Aye. Matt Fee? Aye. Rachel Freeman? Aye. Ian Golding? Aye. Jen Carberg? Aye. Joanna Roach? Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you all. Um, we uh, don't know when that will appear on the select board agenda, um, but if it's not before our next meeting, hopefully we will have a date and we can announce that at the next meeting. Um, all right, the next item on the agenda is the review and discuss town meeting articles with significance for coastal resilience. Uh, we've included a link to the warrant. Um, do any committee members have articles that they would like to suggest for discussion regarding coastal resilience. Uh, Leah, you can stop the screen share of the report and uh, be ready to share the warrant if we need it. Any suggestions on town meeting articles from the warrants? Uh, town meeting is May 6th. Okay, Vince, uh, you had identified uh, a couple of articles with direct impact for coastal resilience. Do you want to list those for us? Uh, sure thing. Yes, I can, Mary. So uh, within Article 10, um, town administration is going to put forward uh, a, um, a fund of $1 million um, from free cash into town treasury, uh, and that is for uh, costs associated with coastal resiliency planning. That is uh, overseen by natural uh, by uh, a town admin, and other departments can seek to use that too. But NRD is going to try and find ways to spend that down as uh, appropriately as possible. Um, the other one that is uh, directly relevant is um, for Millie's Bridge. Uh, this is a project that's been run through Natural Resources and Town Admin, um, where we're looking at sustain uh, the structural sustainability of Millie's Bridge. Um, and look at some dune works in that area as well, potentially. Uh, that's another fund of a million dollars. There's another one that is cost associated with permitting for dredging of Corpus Harbor and Madras Harbor. That's $550,000. So, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, $555,000. Missed, missed $5,000 the first time. And that has been among two natural resources um, that will have some direct impacts because it's happening within the coastal environment. But what happens to the sand from that will be something that will be 
of huge interest and that could be directly beneficial. Um, so I'll be trying to understand that point too. There are a great many other articles in the um, warrant, art, uh, warrant articles that have indirect um, potentials for the Coast Resilience Plan. Um, there, we, can, we have enumerated some of them, but um, most are very small or very slight, and we will be keeping an eye. Thank you, Vince. Sarah? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, this is um, through Mary to Vince, just for a point of clarification, because I'm taking notes. So you mentioned Article 10, and then you mentioned Millie's Bridge and the dredging project. Were those specific articles, or all of those all lumped together, just since you had it right in front of you? There are different points within Article 10. Okay, thank you. Right, and Article 10 is the general fund expenditure, so that's essentially the town budget. Great, I just wanted to make sure that for point of clarification, thank you. Joanna? Uh, the, the million dollars from the Millie's Bridge is in the capital budget. Um, okay, so it says general fund capital expenditure, so that's the name yeah, of the Yeah, it's article. in the same warrant article, but it's yeah. a capital, like that's a capital uh, request. There's just a slight difference. Uh, I, I mean, I think that I've probably said this before. This is a comment I wanted to make. I think a million dollars is too little considering you know, the job that we have ahead mm -hmm. of us. And I'm concerned that if there's not, I mean, for this year, obviously it's late, right? For, for any type of an increase, but I think going forward, we have to come up with a more aggressive way to fund these projects. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, for history, I think what Christy Kickham told us was that um, this amount could be evaluated every year. It was not set in stone. Um, but I want to point out that town administration went ahead and made a commitment to fund coastal resilience at some level. And this is, I think, the third year that they've allocated funds, if not worth. Um, so we appreciate seeing that. And it's also been rising. I think it was half a million previously. It's now a million. Um, so we were definitely getting support from the town in that area. And I think the more that we can make the case for the funds that are needed, the more likely it is that the funds will be available. Other comments, town warrant articles? All right. I did go through the list and I tried to look at it with a little bit different lens to say which articles could inspire coastal resilience or potentially uh, have an impact for coastal resilience. You know, if um, if we were to um, either you know imagine something um, for next year in the same vein, or um, take a look at you know consequences of a project that may not be directly related to coastal resilience, but could potentially have an impact. Um, Vince, there were two um, general fund capital expenditure items in Article Ten from the Natural Resources Department, uh, costs associated with developing a baseline environmental data collection program. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not specific in the article what that is for, and that may not have a coastal resilience impact. But the first thing I thought of there was the shoreline change monitoring program. And I wasn't sure if that was included here um, or if that kind of thing could be included in this kind of request in the future. I can speak about that one, Mary. Um, yeah. That is regards to the habitat surveys that the Natural Resources has been doing in Nantucket Harbor, and we're hoping to do it in Vatican Harbor. So it's eelgrass densities and also shellfish abundance. Um, and then there's also stormwater and groundwater monitoring in that as well. Right, so those are um, data collection efforts that could inform coastal resilience measures, um, looking at effectiveness or applicability of living shorelines or something else in that thing. Matt? No, you, you asked about uh, shoreline change monitoring. That's one that's in there. Is that what I've been asked uh, multiple times, as has Vince, about uh, why are we not including Baxter Road in some of those measurements. They used to be included. Now, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. So I'm wondering, are those gonna be back in the regular uh, list at some point? Vince? Uh, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Matt. So it's this is a tricky balancing act, and this comes down to some legal standing questions that we're trying to resolve. Um, 
and this is all directly related to the current and ongoing works on, on, on the Baxter Road area. So since 2018, the town has been collecting monitoring data on Baxter Road um, on a combination of both private and public properties. The issue arose that in March 5th, uh, the amended order of conditions expired and there was question over the uh, Natural Resources Department uh, commissions to access the private properties. We can still go on the public paths where they're marked and once we know about it. But there's a handful where there's um, where they're on private property, and then reporting those from private property is is with, we need the property owner's permission. We're seeking to regain those permissions. We have reached out to the property owners involved, and um, it's it's slow. It's slow going trying to get these people uh, to to respond. So I'm sorry that it hasn't been as quickly. Uh, uh, they, they haven't been responding as quickly. I'm hoping that over the summer, once they come back and are here at their properties for the summer, that I can catch them in a more direct way than by email and be able to get those permissions back in place. Um, that, that's my hope at the moment. We have the private paths. I had, don't mind putting those up, but putting up those are, uh, doesn't help because most of those are several hundred or things. Uh, it's the ones where there's private property that are skinny are the, the concern. Uh, thank you, Vince. I want this. This is now off topic uh, by a large margin, so I, I apologize. Um, I don't want to take follow up on that. Matt, did you have another comment about the town warrant? Well, just a, a comment on this. I know we're off topic a little bit, Mary, but this is a reason. You know, one which was cooperative, it was easy to get it. Now that it's a little less cooperative, it's harder. I think that the uh, you know, in general, in, in general, one of the things I sent, everyone should just hear this. I've sent to uh, Vince is when we when we look at this from a neighborhood perspective, whatever we agree with with the neighborhood needs to allow this type of access so that we can monitor and do our jobs. I know I'm sort of sp stating the obvious to Vince, but I want everyone else to know that there are all these other tentacles that we need to be aware of. So thank you. Okay, uh, returning to town meeting warrant articles. Um, again, in the general fund uh, capital expenditures article 10, there were several um, DPW, um, so costs associated with multi-use path maintenance and repair. Um, if when, when further on, and there are also costs uh, specific to the wall winning bike path. And one of the things that occurred to me is that where bike paths are in uh, flood prone areas, there may be opportunities to use those bike paths as coastal resilience measures uh, if they become barriers. And so, I, you know, again, total speculation, not something that's included in this warrant, but uh, just reading through the warrant, um, looking for ways that coastal resilience can be worked into existing projects. Um, that same thing for sidewalk improvements and, and so on. Um, and road maintenance. So those are all items in the general budget. Uh, Matt? Yeah, those are all really good suggestions, Mary. The other one that I always kind of try to keep my uh, eye on is the landfill because that's in a storm, storm tide pathway. It's not going to happen in 10 years or 20 years, but a little longer than that, it might. And so I think that any expenditure out there, we need to be kind of thinking long, long, long term. Uh, you know, so I know we're capping the landfill, but at some point, are we going to are we going to hard armor it and protect it? Or are we going to dig it up and, you know, and utilize it for energy somehow and make it pristine again? I have no idea, but that's sort of a long term thinking we need to start putting into the equation. Thank you, Matt. Rachel. Thank you, Mary. I just wanted to add that the bike path as a resiliency measure is something that we're really strongly considering at Washington Street, and that's a, a big piece of the puzzle, as is um, at Kansu Springs. So considering the height of that bike path berm and using that as a flood defense mechanism. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, moving on the town pier improvements, those obviously have resiliency impacts, as uh, Matt was explaining to us that uh, this year, we're doing more than just repairing the town pier. We're improving its capability for storm resistance. Uh, so that's always good to see. Um, as Matt mentioned, the landfill closure cost, that is one that I flagged as well. I think Matt's already explained the relevance of that. 
the when, well, when it road shared use path, as I mentioned, um, you know, the potential for coastal resiliency to be incorporated into that construction. And I looked at the town GIS with the MCFRM for the Wall Rennet Road uh, path for that bike path. There is a considerable risk of flooding along that path. And so I think it will be, I think this is the right time because we're still in a concept stage for that path um, to um, try and, and work out whether or not a coastal residency measure uh, can be incorporated into the construction of that path. Um, so there's an appropriation um, for that, um, let's see, uh, which includes costs of professional services for design, permitting, engineering, construction, and supervision and materials and such. Um, so I think that's the right entry point for that. Peter? Yes, uh, in reference to the town pier, um, work was done this winter, um, extending the barrier to the sort of the north um, the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board feels that the barrier was put in the wrong place. It needs to go to the south. It's the reason what that exposed area is the reason why the um, that the floating dock system gets battered every single year. Is there's no protection for it, and so we're hoping. I mean, I don't know if we're off topic here or not, but we're hoping that money could go toward extending it to the south as well, which would further help with um, resilience. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, my comment, pond dredging, um, I wasn't sure if any materials from that might be suitable. It's, it's a different environment, so I wasn't sure, but I just you know mentioned anytime there's dredging to see if there's material that can be used elsewhere. Vince? Um, very briefly on that, my comment, pond dredging uh, uh, works. Um, the dredge planning for that is now underway. I'm working on that project. I have the exact same question and hope. We don't know the quality of the material that's going to come out yet. So that's the biggest question before we get on to if we can use it for nourishment, if it's usable. And uh, one of the reasons for the dredging is because of the substantial sedimentation. So it might not be good quality, but fingers crossed. Thanks, Vince. Uh, I apologize. I wasn't giving the article numbers as I was discussing those. So briefly, um, the town pier is Article 12, the landfill closure is Article 13, the Wall Winnet Road shared use path is Article 14, the My Comet Pond dredging is Article 16. Um, next one I saw was Article 17, so amend description of public works facility design location. So again, to Matt's point, um, we're adding 10 Sun Island Road as a potential uh, DPW facility location, moving the existing facility off of the Mattica Road and into a more uh, protected location. So that is uh, potentially a resiliency benefit. Uh, Article 20, the Stormwater Enterprise Fund. Uh, Vince, can you tell us a little bit more about this one? I'm afraid I don't know all that much about it. Um, sorry to say, um, to most everything to do with stormwater is now going through the sewer department um, instead of the DPW. What I can do is I'll seek uh, an update uh, from David Gray on this one, and I'll try and send a written uh, update to the committee afterwards. How's that? Uh, well, I, I, you know, we're not trying to influence this particular warrant article, so there's not a sense of urgency, and we are going to try and get David Gray to come talk to us about the sewer facility. So I think that can be part of the discussion. Um, but uh, my my point in looking at this one, this is a new enterprise fund. Um, so if there was a, if, if we pursued an enterprise fund structure for funding of coastal resilience projects, uh, this is an example of how one was created. And because it is stormwater management, that does have a coastal resilience impact. So that's all good to see. Um, Article 22, enterprise funds, capital expenditures. Uh, so the airport had costs associated with perimeter road and fence relocation. Um, and I think we have heard, I'm sorry, I don't remember from who, that the airport is now looking at the vulnerability to its uh, South Coast facilities. And so perhaps this is funding that is going to address that. Um, and then there are stormwater enterprise uh, fund expenditures. Um, again, island-wide drainage improvements and the management of the stormwater program. So uh, just good to see those coming through. Um, Article 24, the Waterways Improvement Fund. 
um, the purpose of maintaining, dredging, cleaning, and improvement of harbors, inland waters, and great ponds, public access thereto, breakwaters, retaining walls, piers, wharves, and moorings thereof. Uh, so again, looking at uh, ways that people are spending money for normal town operations, but that might have a coastal resiliency uh, benefit or be able to be uh, integrated with a coastal residency project. Um, Article 26, the ferry embarkation fee. Uh, again, looking at uh, potential sources of funding. Uh, this is uh, to be used, uh, including but not limited to provision of harbor services, public safety protection, emergency services, infrastructure improvements within and around Nantucket Harbor, and professional services. Uh, so again, the potential for integration of coastal residency measures in this kind of funding. Um, the Community Preservation Committee funding, uh, I noted there in their open space and recreation section that there were no applications. And so they are reserving funds for future applications. And so again, I thought that was interesting. Perhaps uh, there is an open space application that could be made that would incorporate coastal residency measures in the future, potential source of funding there. Um, and then we get into real estate conveyances. So there is uh, Ames Avenue, which we know is a vulnerable location. Um, and also um, Goose Pond Lane, Spruce Street, Washington Street, Monomoy Creeks, um, East Creek Road, Easy Street. So just as a general list, these are all properties that are in vulnerable areas. And it looks like the town is uh, working with the land bank and then the land bank would potentially be able to implement coastal resilience measures. Uh, speculation on my part, certainly not uh, directly implied in this, but just looking at opportunities. Rachel, is there anything that you wanted to say from the land bank's perspective on these articles? Not at this time, Mary. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, so that that was a run through of the warrant. And it, I thought it was you know, interesting that if you start looking at it with a coastal resilience lens, you do see opportunities. So hopefully, um, especially for those of us that sit on committees that might be um, able to influence the articles in the future, we can start to get those um, coastal resilience perspectives incorporated. Matt? Yeah, and in the future, I think maybe we should, you know, do our run through earlier and see if there's anything we want to do. I think that your example of the dump is landfill is a good one. Uh, we've mo we're moving to high ground partly because of uh, comments I made because of stuff I learned here, uh, and so we are moving the trucks and the buildings. And we were going to spend 16, so that's probably 24, 30 million in today's dollars to build some buildings out there. Uh, I voted against it at the select board level because we didn't in, they, in the planning didn't include a transfer station or anything else, which I think, you know, which I consider part of the landfill. So we're going to move the trucks and the buildings, but we're still going to have the landfill there. So I voted against because I wanted that part of the planning process and it wasn't included. So it's we're we're making we're making inroads. It, it's going to be slow. Thank you, Matt. Other comments on the town meeting warrant articles. And uh, as I said, I think for many of them, um, you know, we're finding out about these through the warrant that that's um, very late in the planning process. For some of them, it's it's still early, uh, but for others, they've. You know that the cost might be very different if a coastal resilience measure was included, and so you know not having the funds to do that means that we've lost the opportunity. Uh, so again, when you're sitting on committees or you see these coming up on agendas, you know please attend and provide a coastal resiliency perspective. Joanna, um, I think that that's a good point, Mary, and I also think that one of the things we could do to be slightly more proactive is to review the. Um, warrant ourselves as a group at the beginning of the process, because then we could know exactly when and where to comment and intervene. So that that warrant typically comes out in December or January, and we could go through it with the eye towards coastal resi resilience and discuss the proposed articles here, and then um, potentially be able to speak to representatives from the committees. Just a suggestion. Uh, Certainly an opportunity, but my point was that we need to do that before the warrant is published, that the articles are already fairly well fixed at that point. Um, and so well, it's much easier to work on it earlier. 
this the the town articles yes but not the citizen warrant articles right that, that i'm referring generally to the town articles yes okay citizen articles are a different animal right peter okay yes um so are we going to make a decision on which articles that this committee is going to comment on and if we do that and pick the ones that we're going to talk if we need to talk then who's going to do the talking? Is it going to be Vince or Leah or you or me or any of us? How does that kind of work? Uh, so this was intended only as a review in our meeting. We're right. certainly uh, able to uh, decide to make a comment that would most likely be either in the form of a handout at town meeting or um, it, on the town meeting floor by an individual as, as you requested. So that would be up to somebody to volunteer to do that or the committee to request um, that handout. Uh, time is very short at this moment. I mean, we're less than a month away. And so we would, if we're gonna do a handout that would have to be created and uh, approved at the next meeting. And then we'd have to do the logistics of that, making sure that we even had an opportunity to do a handout. I'm not sure what the regulations are on that. Um, just, Peter, yes. Just a quick follow up before Matt. Um, so, <clears throat> I I think we have a very informed population on the island, so people are probably going to look to us on certain things. So we may get questions. I'm just saying we need to be prepared. Is all. Great, thank you, Peter. Matt. Yeah, oh, one other art, one other article is 87, Home Rule Petition, Real Estate Conveyance of Alter Rock. That has to do with uh, resiliency because it's a potential swap swap with Sheep's Pond. Sheep's Pond Road, which is, this is our third road that we've been putting in out in that area because of erosion. And so that's another one that we should support because the town is swapping, you know, land at Alter Rock for, you know, for a road that conservation will own out in uh, Sheep's Pond area and the neighbors will have access. The neighbors and the public will have an access over an easement on the road. So, you know, that is another resiliency action that's going on that's a little bit under the radar. Great, thank you for that additional information, Matt. Other comments? Again, for um, voters, um, you can certainly speak individually at town meeting on any of these articles. Um, if there is a feeling in the committee that we want to publish a handout, we can investigate that, but we would need uh, direction from the committee to do that. I'm not seeing anybody advocating for that. Gary? Just one comment, Mary. Uh, what you mentioned is that there's a million dollars in the, I guess, in the capital plan, which is in the, the general funding uh, article. And that's in this year's plan. And I'm not sure how it got to be a million dollars. I'm thrilled we have a million dollars, but it probably should be a lot more than that for the future. And so how is it that that number set aside uh, in the capital planning program represents what we would prefer? Do we have to start talking to Christy or someone uh, on the capital planning group? as to what our druthers are for the future, since it's gonna come up as part of that general expenditure warrant article? Uh, that's a great question, Gary. And uh, I, I think you have a good point that if we are able to influence that um, before that number is chosen for next year, that would be a wise course. Vince? Uh, thank you, Mary. Just as some minor bit of background, the last year it was $500,000 that was initially uh, appropriated for this and another uh, amount of cash I think that came from free cash out effect to a sum of $1 million. Mary kind of already hinted to this earlier. This year it's uh, around, it's exactly a million dollars uh, from one source not supplemented. Uh, so we have to es essentially, um, we've the same as last year, but in some ways we've doubled last year even though you can't spend the same dollar twice. Long story short, you just have to start somewhere. We had to pick a number, uh, a number had to be generated for where do we start. Um, and a million was what was chosen. 
um, and we need to now, as has already been said, work out how do we escalate that, how do we elevate that to a, a more appropriate uh, amount of money that can see projects getting done. Um, it is a small amount of money, and for some of the projects we need to get off the ground in the next year, we're going to have to potentially make some tough choices. And I will again bang the drum for the uh, retreat and resilience uh, planning uh, uh, document that we need to get ASAP. That is certainly one of the most necessary, but we could argue about 10 other projects that are equally as necessary. Thank you, Vince. Uh, also, the, the, the million dollars is um, sort of the alternative that is not more money, but none. Uh, the, I mean, I'm very grateful to town administration that they said, we don't know what we're going to spend. We haven't seen any justification for it, but we know we need to spend something. So let's put some money in the budget and then figure out how to spend it. That's not how most town spending goes. <laughs> you know, most of the time you identify a need, you find out how much it costs, and then you request the funding. And, and so we're able to get the funding even before we've had a specific request for it. And that is uh, something I'm truly grateful for. Matt? Yeah, Mary is right. We, you know, we're grateful, but I think over the next six or nine months, we should look at what the priority is for this year and put the, and, and put numbers to those and then request them and go through the capital uh, process or go through other processes or make sure that the committee or the you know, board or commission that's responsible goes through the processes. I think you know, that's kind of our next step. Uh, in regards to this year, I don't think we need to do a pamphlet and make more work for ourselves. I think most of this stuff is somewhat self you know, explanatory and I think people will support it and we can all speak individually, but I think in the future we should, we should prioritize and what things, because if we just do it based on how much the select board or Libby or whatever throws at us, we will not hit the benchmarks that we've set, that, that we expect and the town has set for us. So we need to, you know, sort of ask for is, what is required. And I think people are counting on us to do that. Yes, I absolutely agree. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and that's why uh, a couple of months ago, we started looking at what are our priorities for the Coastal Resilience Plan, and that topic will definitely return um, you know, sooner rather than later. Are there comments or questions on the town meeting warrant articles? Right. Uh, seeing none, going on to the next item on the agenda. Let me pull the agenda back up. Um, so that is an update on the sediment transport study and dredge plan uh, that will be from Vince Murphy. Uh, thank you very kindly, Mary. Um, in March, uh, the sediment transport study and dredge plan contract uh, was awarded to Arcadis with subconsultants Baird, Coastal Engineering Company, and an independent um, uh, contractor who's gonna work with them, Alyssa, Dr. Alyssa Novak. So yesterday we had our kickoff meeting um, with uh, the principals involved, um, and we had from the town side, I was part of the team, as was Jeff Carson, Natural Resources Director, Tara Riley um, from the hatchery. Um, we had Sheila Lucy, uh, because a lot of this is going to be the water, I need her involved, and we need to get her up to speed and, uh, so that we can keep her abreast of everything that's changing and needs to, and whatever surveys are taking place, so that when she gets a, a call over the radio, there's a, a boat driving erratically. Uh, we can, she can resolve that quickly. Uh, we're trying to get all that up to speed. We also had Greg Tibman from Town Admin, who's going to also um, be part of the update committee. So we went through the leadership of the project. Um, Devin McGee, who uh, served as the assistant to Trevor on the um, CRP, uh, they've, they're going to do a bit of role reversal, uh, and Trevor is going to assist her, but Devin McGee uh, is now in charge. Sorry. Devin McKay, she, she, she recently uh, got married and changed her name. She was Devin McKay before. Um, so, and we've got from uh, Baird, we've got Irene Watts, who has also worked on the CRP and she's also experienced with some of the issues on um, Baxter Road for the planning we did there. Um, and we have very well experienced um, uh, people on a very large and one of the most comprehensive teams uh, that applied for this. So we all understand a little bit how Arcadis work. They love a good project statement. They're currently working on this. And if you don't mind, I can read it to you. Um, 
so the project purpose, uh, support Nantucket's understanding of sediment transport within Nantucket, Madigat, and Polpus harbors through a data-driven modeling approach informed by our team's understanding of the island and its resilience goals. Use results to guide decision-making and maximize sediment resources while reducing unintended uh, um, yeah, sediment resources. So they provide, they went over what their idea for the roadmap is. We have a little bit of feedback to go through on that. But effectively, this comes down to understanding um, the, the, the tasks of the plan. There's four main tasks in the plan uh, that they uh, and they responded to uh, each one. The tasks are the sediment transport study itself. Uh, that's task one. Task two is the dredge research and engineering phase. Task three is the permit and scheduling for dredging works. And task four is the beach nourishment part of the project. Within um, some of the engineering works of task two, there's also going to be preparations to look at what might a, um, a, a sand bank look like in an island. We might be at such enormously large volumes over time that we might not have a place to look at it. So we might also have to look at moving beach nourishment along in a, in a different way. So that is going to be one of those nice co-benefits that's going to come from this plan. Um, they worked out a timeline. The contract we asked for was 18 months and they have provided uh, what we consider an extremely valuable way of moving forward in a quite an expedient way. Uh, it's going to take everything from bathymetric surveys, uh, eel, uh, understand eel gas locations and other um, hydrographic surveys. Uh, they're going to do uh, drone surveys, uh, deploy um, some monitoring equipment, under, uh, take some sediment cores in the next while, and under um, take sediment grab samples. Their survey work actually kicks off towards the end of this month. Everything will be on the water and coming and going through um, uh, town piers, I understand it. Um, they're due to finish in September 2024. This is going to be one of those nice, long and involved uh, um, surveys uh, to get the most comprehensive information we can get. We've also built in um, updates uh, for the Coast Resilience Advisory Committee and the Select Board along the way. So expect more, lots more. Thank you, Vince. Uh, questions on that plan or that project, I should say. Comments from committee members. All right, we do have RJ Turcott from the Land Council in attendance. Um, RJ, you have expressed an interest in this topic, and we did forward your letter from last November to the committee members. Uh, if you have comments, I'd welcome them. Thank you, Mary. Um, RJ Turcott on behalf of the Nantucket Land Council. Uh, again, I would encourage you to get this as an agenda item for discussion as soon as possible. I know things are busy, but uh, this is an enormous project. This might be the biggest thing that this committee can help with in implementing and figuring out what the funding is for. And I really, really strongly believe that the committee needs to go out and find as many opinions as possible on how to do this more comprehensively instead of piecemeal harbor by harbor. Um, I understand that the funding has already gone through for this initial portion, but there's a lot more to it than that. And it's going to impact every single thing we do for coastal resilience on Nantucket. And if it's done the right way the first time, uh, we won't have to do it again. So I just request a more detailed conversation for the committee uh, at a future agenda. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. Uh, yes, we can do that. Other comments on this topic? And as Vince said, they will be coming back to us with updates. All right, next item on the agenda, uh, grant updates. So we have uh, several grant opportunities that are being pursued. Uh, uh, Leah and Vince are going to present about the MVP, the CCM and the SNEP grant programs. So Vince, are you going first, I think? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mary. So I'm only going to discuss one, the MVP. Um, I've already said this at previous meetings. I've already sought some feedback and some, well, some early feedback and some, um, uh, I flew some kites and tried to see what MVP would be interested in. Um, that they are 
interested in uh, when I pitched ideas in the South Shore, essentially they weren't on board. Um, we already had the downtown uh, flood barrier as a CZM grant, and I'm going to leave that alone because that's Leah's uh, to talk about next. Um, what they seemed to like best from the suggestions was uh, for a climate action plan. This is something that they thought would be very useful for Nantucket. They talked about how it was quite competitive, um, but they saw there and understanding that. Um, MVP rules uh, got launched uh, towards the end of March, been working through those. There's been some minor updates. They have some core principles that we have to try and understand and match up with to try and make it all make sense, uh, as well as other small rule changes. So I'm starting to piece this together. Um, it's not something that's directly related to the post years Supervisory Committee, but if it's okay uh, with the chair and other members, I might try and touch base with uh, people along the way as this develops to try and um, get the maximum input along the way. So this is kind of the one of the overarching problems and it related to sustainability that we don't have a good answer for yet to understand our climate action plan and planning to understand how we can start to have our local impact to reduce our carbon footprint, understand even what we bring here uh, and uh, in terms of fuels and other resources and how we can start to look at changing that dynamic to reduce um, impacts to the environment. So the next um, thing that I'll be doing is reaching out to individuals with um, the correct, uh, with, with relevant experience, not correct experience, that's the wrong way of putting it, with relevant experience. So it, um, I'll, I'll be touching base with some people. And uh, the other thing that I would request uh, is once I get this together, I will need letters of support. So I'll probably need a letter of support from this committee, even though it's not directly related to the Coast Resilience uh, Plan. Thank you, Vince. Questions or comments on the MVP grant opportunity for Vince? Gary? I'm disappointed because we have these 40 priorities and this funding won't, apparently won't help any of those 40 priorities. That's disappointing to me, unless you can figure out, Vince, how to find some connection between what they're looking for on climate change and some one or more of our 40 priorities. Yeah, it, it's challenging, Gary. Um, on the Cape, MVP is funding a low-lying roads program, which is a direct coastal resilience um, issue. And yet they were not interested in our downtown neighborhood flood barrier, which is also a low-lying roads, um, you know, direct coastal resilience issue. So it's very challenging to um, figure out exactly what they will go for. And the the danger is always that if we ask for what we want and not what they are interested in, then we waste our effort because they decide not to fund it, and we could have spent that time and resource elsewhere. So it's it's tough. There, there's no guarantee with the grants. Other comments for Vince? Sarah? Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Um, I, I sort of echo Gary a little bit. I mean, I think having a climate action plan for the island is, is a good idea, but I think even Mary's exact point of the low-lying roads, um, we have a lot of low-lying roads. We could do have a more direct um, application for uh, that's more immediate. I don't think, I mean, obviously I'm not on the committee that decides um, what grants are written, nor am I on the committee deciding whether, you know, I'm not on the MVP committee, but I think that I can understand from um, the flood barrier project being sort of a far further out project. Um, I think as an advisory committee, this is the perfect committee to help advise on which funding opportunities might be able to be go go for. Um, that being said, this, these decisions are obviously already made, so I'm happy to help um, with any draft um reading through or anything like that but i think using the committee as it stands um what it's for would be good moving forward thank you sarah um uh, i have a note jen carberg is going to have to leave the meeting um so that's 10 55 a.m thank you jen for letting us know uh rachel Thank you, Mary. I, I'm also kind of interested, and I, I know I'm not involved in this either, but I am interested in 
um, the concept of the neighborhood downtown neighborhood flood barrier and you know the fact that it hasn't gotten funded by or wasn't funded by CZM and now is not an interest of the MVP. I'm just curious um, what your feeling is about that. This is for Leah and Vince. Um, and if there's a something, a bigger picture question that's going on in the background, or is is this just something you feel like we should just keep pursuing in different directions? Thank, Thank you. you, Rachel. Vince? Um, the next mm -hmm. item on the agenda is to talk about the CZM application and how we're going to reapply the downtown neighborhood flood barrier based on their feedback from last year. So we're absolutely doing that uh, for CZM. They, they were, um, I, I'm only going to repeat myself from what I uh, told the committee, I think last October, after I got feedback from CZM in September, okay. they were really appreciative of our application. They found some minor problems. Um, they okay. really strongly encouraged us to apply for a CZM application again, but you know we have to try and diversify and broaden ourselves out. So okay. that's why, uh, where when we spoke to um, MVP, a, a different state organization to try and understand uh, what might be most yeah. applicable for what oh. they're looking at. Um, that's how the Climate Action Plan uh, came into the conversation. And they particularly liked, and I can only talk about this in really super broad terms because this is just a kind of them seeing it, what might be broadly interesting. They like the idea of us doing a Climate Action okay, Plan perfect. because um, it was an island. It's isolated our connections to other communities are you know far more limited um, and we can form a good model and a good roadmap for how other communities can undertake it um, say other communities that have another town directly abutting or another municipality directly abutting their climate action plans are that bit more complicated because of neighbors frankly so th this is one of the interests for Nantucket doing a, a climate action plan I appreciate that that it's something that the Coast Resilience Advisory Committee would like to see a Coast Resilience project put to, but it's based on the feedback I, I, I received uh, early on. And it's also based on the fact that um, I need to try and bring out what Natural Resources Department um, is doing with sustainability. So we're hitting larger goals as well. So all of that played in together to, to the decision-making process. Thank you, Vince. Uh, anything further on the MVP program before we go to Leah for the CZM update? No, go ahead, Leah. Okay, thanks, Mary. Um, so back in March, I attended a CZM webinar about applying for the grant, um, and the RFP should be out at the end of this month, and then you have six weeks before the application is due. So as far as timing goes, um, they announce the grantees in July or August, and then contracts get signed around September and you can start work end of September into October. The project can either be one or two years. So for the one that we will be reapplying for, it'll be a two year project. Um, so it needs to be implemented by June 30th, 2025. Um, and then, so this will be considered the proactive planning that they have a couple, you know, five different types of projects that you can choose from. And the downtown flood barrier phase one would be proactive planning. So um, just as a reminder, the design flood elevation for the project, um, it'll be further studied and confirmed through the study. It's based on projections from frequent, frequent flooding from high tides and regular storms. And um, it'll advance the conceptual design for phase one. So from straight, straight wharf to steamboat wharf. Um, and then it will uh, be suitable for us to be able to find like additional funding to actually implement um, the project as a whole. It will include a detailed risk-based phasing plan for refining the conceptual design for flood barrier to confirm the actual locations of it and also the timing. It'll have a feasibility assessment, which would um, allow for you know, it to go through the regulatory process and also to have cost estimates. And then it will have a large community engagement aspect of it as well. So like Vince had mentioned, um, we did get some great feedback from CZM and that feedback included uh, actually reducing outreach in year one 
because they really recommend that we need to focus on focus more on the engineer designing of it. And then they also recommend kind of flip-flopping the tasks from uh, year one and year two. So for year one, the tasks were long-term community engagement plan to develop that and, and also activities. So like creating a website and focus groups and, and stuff like that. Um, and then also project phasing and implementation planning and advanced conceptual design. So that'll be now year two instead of year one. Um, and year one would include doing the technical feasibility assessment with benefit cost analysis, a feasibility design, and then community engagement as well. So um, again, those will be flip-flopped. And then they suggested to adjust the budget because in the budget, the uh, community engagement planning, feasibility assessment, um, and year two engagement were all at 15% of the total project. So they recommended reducing the community engagement percentage and then um, speaking the percentages for those four topics. So, um, I mean, the grant is, you know, pretty much all written. We just need to tweak a couple of those aspects of it and it should be good to go. Thank you, Leah. Uh, let me briefly note Joanna Roach had to leave the meeting at 11 a.m. Uh, questions or comments for Leah on the CZM proposal? Well, hopefully uh, we'll get a much um, stronger reaction from CZM to be able to fund it. It'd be great to see that go forward. That'll be great. Uh, and then we also have the Southern New England program of the EPA. Leah, you want to tell us about that? Sure. Yeah. So um, I actually made a little presentation. That's why I had in this last meeting was because I was giving this presentation to all of the SNAP recipients. So I'm just going to share my screen um, so that you all can. Okay, so um, this project is called the Sacagawea Ecological Enhancement and Resilience Strategies, obviously on Nantucket. Um, so the project location, you all know where it is. Um, it's this pink area where the pond and the road interface. And we are um, partnering with Mass Audubon because they are property owners on one aspect of, um, of the project. And then just a little background. Um, in 2017, the, the homeowners came to the Natural Resources Department and they were worried about the pond's health. And so we were investigating ways where we could try to improve the water quality within the pond, thinking oyster restoration. Um, and then they had, they had funded some baseline data um, to kind of get like conceptual design for this site. And then the storm hit in 2018 and we all know that the road started to erode away and needed a quick fix, which then turned into enforcement um, by the DEP. So we are trying to get that enforcement rectified. Um, and the goals of the project are, there's a few goals, um, but primarily to protect Pulpus Road using the best environmentally friendly solution while providing adequate protection to maintain the integrity of the roadway. To address the problem of wind and water driven erosion occurring at the interface of the pond and the road by using wave attenuation um, structures like reef, reef balls. And then to increase the natural oyster habitat within the pond by providing that suitable substrate, which are reef balls, to improve water quality through um, uh, to increase the biodiversity within the pond and surrounding coastal habitats, and then use this project as an educational experience for locals and visitors to learn about adaptable nature-based solutions to climate change and you know, the benefits of restoration projects, and then to serve as a model that's transferable around New England for other um, towns and organizations to be able to use. So this project, um, the SNAP portion of it is funding the reef ball portion, but it has kind of two aspects of the project. We're hoping to create a living shoreline between the road and the pond. So um, 
to act as like a, a nature-based solution for the erosion that's happening there. This little depiction on the right, I stole it off the internet, um, but it goes into why living shorelines are uh, first bulkheads and, you know, for erosion control, environment, as, environmental aspects, storm resilience, the cost and the lifetime of um, these two structures. So we're hoping to, to go with the nature-based solution for, um, for that. And then I mentioned reef ball. So this is what SNAP is actually purchasing for us. They are eco-friendly concrete structures that range you know, from very small to extremely large, and they provide habitat for oysters and also offer that vertical relief or uh, wave attenuation as well. So they, they act similarly to oyster castles, which um, Jen and I had worked on that project in Pulpus Harbor. So um, we're hoping to be able to use reef balls within Sacaja Pond. This is just a conceptual design that was done a couple of years ago um, by Horsley and Witten. And again, we're, we're going to be figuring out the exact design for the reef balls and which size reef balls and all of that. So this picture just depicts three rows of reef balls that are subtitled. And then it shows kind of a living shoreline aspect with the, the natural veget vegetation. So for the SNEP grant, we have hired the Woods Hole Group to um, be our consultants, and they will be doing the surveys, the design, and the permitting. And we need to implement uh, this project by December 2024. So we're on a bit of a time crunch because permitting can take up to a year. The deliverables, we're going to be putting a sign at the project site to um, you know, educate the public about what's going on, and then offer tours at the site, work with school groups, present at conferences, hopefully get a publication out of it, and then have a town web page and an interactive story map. The next steps are we need to uh, submit a quality assurance project plan to the EPA. And so that just spells out you know, all the surveys that will be happening, how the data is gonna be collected, how it's gonna be analyzed, and what we'll be doing with it after that. So that is to ensure that, you know, this project can be replicated in other towns and other water bodies. And, um, and then we're gonna be doing a bathymetric survey, a topographic survey, and a sediment survey. I don't know, this is kind of hard to see, but this just breaks out all of the tasks um, with the timeline. I created a easier concept of one. So from now until August, the surveys and the modeling will occur. And then permitting and final design, as again said, will take about a year. We'll be installing the reef in 2024, and then hopefully installing the living shoreline a year or two after that, once that gets permitted, and then monitoring and maintenance will um, occur after that. So that is the SNEP grant. In a nutshell, it was about $158,000, and it was the first um, SNEP grant that the town has received. Great, thank you, Leah. And so for that $158,000, how much of the project is that going to pay for? So that will pay for um, about $30,000 will go towards the permitting, and then about $90,000 for the reef falls um and or maybe it's a little bit more um and then some implement you know actually putting them in the water uh it'll cover that as well and then there's i think our in-kind service is about 33 percent of the project and um last town meeting two hundred and fifty thousand dollars was allocated towards this project so that is being used to hire the consultants, do all the surveys and all of that. So the town is shipping in quite a few thousand dollars, uh, hundreds of thousand dollars to get this project going. And so is the Living Shoreline um, funded or will that need additional funds to install? Yeah, that, that will need additional funding. So we'll, we'll be sourcing grants for that. Um, and, you know, maybe town money. I'm, I'm not sure yet. We haven't gotten to that. Okay, Matt. 
Yeah, there's a wetland on the other side of the road. Is there going to be a connection between one side and the other side of the road, you know, culverts or anything like that? And if not, what is the projected time life for this installation? Is it 20 years, 30 years? Uh, Leah? Uh, so there's actually three culverts that go to that wetland, but they are extremely undersized and um, there's a lot of sediment in the culvert, so they're not really functioning properly. Um, but the sewer department is now has a maintenance um, schedule for, for those culverts, which I need to talk to David Gray about to see, you know, what, what the maintenance schedule is and how poor are the culverts. Um, but as far as the project time, you know, it we want it to be adaptable for when the causeway is put into um, Pulpus, or sorry, Pulpus Road, which is in the CRP. So whatever design is approved, um, it will be able to go, you know, increase in height and be adaptable. That's what's so great about these nature-based solutions is that they're not hard structures. You can add to them. You can increase their elevation. So we're hoping that it will get us to the timeline where we can implement the CRP um, project. Okay, Ian? Uh, thank you, Mary. So um, what's Mass Audubon's position on this? Have they been consulted? Because they actually own the property, right? And they weren't consulted when the DPW put in that, um, that first erosion control measure. Leah? Thank you, Mary. Um, they are partners with us. So we meet with them every three weeks to give you know, project updates and, and talk about the project. And um, it needs to be approved by the town and Mass Audubon for whatever design we go with. So they're, in the loop 100% um, and we're working together. Great, thank you. Thanks Leah. Matt? Yeah, I, I was asking the question because I know in the CR, I, I believe in the CRP we were gonna raise those roads and have the water flow through. So if we're not gonna do that, if we're changing course and we're gonna be making a, you know, a, um, it's not hard armoring, but it's, you know, it's armoring of some type. It's nicer armoring than hard armoring. If we're gonna be doing that, that's slightly different. So we'd have to be taking that away if we're gonna raise the road. If we're gonna keep those culverts in, I would like to make sure that, or, or if we need to expand them to get 30 or 50 years out of this, then I think we should make sure that's in the design of this. You know, if that's gonna become a, a bottleneck for this, if we're gonna take this sort of blocking water technique for a while, how long are we gonna do that for? And if it's going to be blocking it, but some flow, then let's make sure we have the right flows. Uh, you know, so we, so we're not wasting time and money. That's all you know. And I'm looking at it over a 30, 50 year time frame. Yeah, um, Leah, help us out here. I don't think the breakwater really blocks the water. I think it absorbs wave energy, and and that means that this project is compatible with. Um, the future project they're, they're not uh they don't one doesn't preclude the other is that correct yeah yeah i would agree with that so the the breakwater would be in the water um as far as the living shoreline aspect i brought this picture up to show you so it's that this area where the road is really close to the pond the wetlands is are further to i guess the south of the actual project site um, and those culverts are further south of, of the project as well. Yeah, sorry, uh, Leah, can I just add one thing to what Leah is saying? Um, she's 100% correct in what she's saying. The, the project, and I'm, there's a big board next to me that has the project names on. Leah has a, a thing about four and a half feet high that has all of the CRP projects printed out on it. If you can't hear me, uh, I apologize. It is the Pogus Road raising culvert expansion and wave attenuation at Sackage Pond. This is the wave attenuation portion of the project um, and is integrated into the old project as Mary and uh, Leah already alluded to. 
Great. Thank you, Vincent, Leah. Right. Further questions on this project? Yes, Ian? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I assume everybody is aware that the uh, existing retaining wall is illegal. So it was never permitted. And um, I, so I assume that as part of the application for CONCOM, it will be removed, right? Yeah. Yes, it will. Great. That's very good. A lot of people will feel that's very good news. Thank you, Lynn. Further questions? All right, uh, so that takes care of grant updates. Um, so next we have the follow-up discussion on policy and finance topics from our previous meetings. Uh, so the, the point of this, um, I wanted to give people an opportunity for any additional comments that they might've had after reflection on those meetings. And also wanted to reference the Coastal Resilience Plan, which does have quite a bit of discussion about potential policy change. And so one thing that we can do is review that um, on our own time and come back with suggestions for which policies that are mentioned in the CRP would be ones that we wanna begin pursuing. Um, that particular item is a little, um, it's, it's one single recommendation in the CRP for policy change, but within that, there are a couple of dozen uh, opportunities. So it's a much bigger project than it looks like for just having one recommendation. Uh, and it is one of the ones in the CRP that is uh, scheduled to begin um, you know, this year um, and uh, be implemented fairly rapidly. So that's definitely an area we wanna pay attention. Um, so if anyone have thoughts or comments uh, following up on the discussions of potential policy change or finance for coastal resilience projects from our last two meetings. All right, if there is none, uh, we can always bring that back as a topic when everybody has a chance to look at the CRP uh, or if they have a particular uh, suggestion for something we should focus on, I'm welcome to put that on the agenda as well. Matt? Yeah, I think we should, I'm not sure how we're gonna get at it, but we really did, we, we had a discussion, but we didn't really uh, delve in, and I, and to my, we didn't really delve into uh, sort of the zoning aspects and what our options are really. I mean, some of us brought it up, but we should, it might have to be a work group. Maybe it's a work group that's uh, included with planning board or NPDC. Um, you know, you're on those, Mary. I'm not sure what, how we do it, but I think uh, we need to th sort of think through what's going to be the best way to put the various options on a piece of paper and prioritize, you know, whether it's whole harmless agreements for homeowners or you know, all the different aspects that we, we've read about, how do we put those on a sheet and decide which ones go first and when, and, you know, who's responsible and how do we get it started? Because if we just sort of wait around for it to happen, plus is really happy, everyone's really busy, everyone's really busy, they've got a million other things to do, we're going to have to spearhead some of this, I think. I absolutely agree, Matt. That, that's why I'm asking for people to come back and say, you know, let's start here. Um, wherever here is. There's a, there's a lot to unpack in that and it's easy to wait for somebody else to do it. Um, and everybody is very busy, as you said, completely agree. So I'm hoping that CR, uh, the CRP will provide enough information for members to say, you know what, this is where we need to start. And uh, looking forward to your comments on that. Um, anything else on this agenda item? I uh, also wanted to mention here that, that we will continue to try and get some state representatives to tell us what's going on at the state level and what the opportunities are there. Um, we, we worked really hard to try and get commitments and we're not able to secure anybody. So thanks to Leah for getting the Sea Grant representative. He was very helpful at the policy meeting, uh, but we will continue to work on getting other state representatives. Sea Grant is not a state agency, but familiar with the state. Um, Okay, public comment. Are there members of the public in attendance that have a comment that they wanna offer at this time? You go ahead and use the raise hand feature or you can unmute yourself and announce. I am not seeing anyone with a comment. Um, 
So the uh, pleasure of the committee uh, for the minutes of February 14th, uh, do members want more time to review those before we try and approve them? I'm hearing, I see one nod. Um, is there anybody that wants to try and approve them today? I'm not seeing any response for that. Um, I did send one correction to Leah. Uh, Jeff Carlson was listed as an attendee, but was not present. So we will uh, make that correction in the minutes and um, everybody should be aware of that as they review them. We will put the adoption on the agenda of the next meeting. And hopefully the March minutes will come out as well and be available. Uh, excuse me, New Business Committee and Natural Resources Department reports. Uh, Peter mentioned that you have a report from the uh, Madigan Har and Harbor uh, update, plan update. Yes, uh, so our first four meetings have basically been getting, uh, us basically been getting uh, organized. Um, you know, now we're going through the, um, the matrix, the implementation matrix from the the 2009, the 2007 plan and trying to decide which things we're gonna uh, carry forward and complete. Um, Dave Franzuto, the representative from the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board determined that uh, about 78% of the recommendations were completed. So that's a good thing. Uh, we've decided that we'll include a lot of the stuff that was com complete, completed as sort of a historical reference as an appendix in the new plan. So we know what we've done. Um, uh, let's see. We haven't really started planning yet. We're waiting for the state approval, the approval from the Coastal Zone Management Office to say, okay, go ahead. Um, and I think that comes uh, sometime in June after our um, first public meeting. So we've only been meeting as a committee, uh, but not um, without, not, not with any public in attendance. So we'll invite the public in um, by Zoom as well as um, in person, as well as to make comments uh, in some on some page that we create, um, and that you know that will be probably the first two weeks of June. Great, thank you, Peter. And Peter is our representative to that committee. Uh, Vince or Leah, any uh, updates from the Natural Resources Department? Leah. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that I'm the Nantucket point person for the Coastal Conference that is going to happen in uh, at the Athenaeum on June 12, and it is all coastal resilience focused. So um, the Save the Date should come out. We're trying to solidify all of the speakers, but the Save the Date should come out by the end of the week, and I'll make sure to send it around to everyone. And it's it's free. Um, it's probably going to be like eight, something like 8 to 4 p.m. for that day. Great. Thank you, Lee. And there's a link to the website for that uh, and the agenda. Um, other updates? Uh, any updates from our committee members? Uh, let me again say welcome to Carl Borchard. Perhaps you want to give us your impression of the fire hose that was just turned on you today. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, very interesting. Um, I was thinking that the Sasachka project would apply to um, the Life Saving Museum crossing, and I need to check on the um, CRP and find out. I'm sure that there's a lot of crossover to other areas for some of these beginning projects. Very interesting uh, situation out there. I've driven by it many times and wondered what could be done so it looked good. Great, thank you, Carl. Um, and Leah, if you can send Carl a, a brief slate of materials that are important uh, for him to be aware of, that would be great. I think we may have done that for Joe Topham when he joined, and we may have done that for you when you became the Coastal Resilience Coordinator, so you might be very familiar with that. Uh, other updates from committee members? Right, not seeing any. <clears throat> the uh, last item on the agenda, discussion of upcoming meeting dates and topics. Our next meeting is April 25th, uh, will be on Zoom. As I mentioned at the beginning, the uh, state government did extend the permission for remote meetings out to 2025. Uh, so it's my assumption that we would continue meeting remotely as that seems to have worked very well and is also 
uh, great for accommodating off-island speakers and uh, when committee members are off-island. Uh, if anybody has suggestions for changing that, please send them to uh, Leah and to me. We can consider them, but um, you know, absence any desire to change, I think we'll continue the way we are. Um, but at the next meeting, the topic will be the um, resilience measures for the Sconset Bluff. Uh, we did have the meeting, uh, not we, but the, there was a meeting of the Select Board and Conservation Commission on March 21st. There is a link to that meeting recording in the agenda. There will also be a follow-up meeting uh, that is tonight at 5 p.m. for the Select Board and ConCom. And uh, that agenda was sent out by email to committee members by Leah this morning. I hope that people will be able to attend or watch the recording so that we can have all of that background information for our meeting on the 25th. It's my understanding that the Select Board and ConCom are not making decisions in these two meetings. They are exploring alternatives. Um, and so we would be able to offer our opinion with the same information that they had. Um, Vince, do you want to add anything about those meetings for the benefit of the committee? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm just going to give the kind of 30,000 foot view because uh, some of the participants are present on the meeting. I don't want to influence anyone. It's a facilitated meeting uh, between the select board and the coast. Uh, and Sorry, so I used to say coasters and the conservation commission. Um, and it's to help both of those boards work better together because there has been some friction. Now, we've had a, a very good first meeting where there was a lot of uh, productive and positive things said. Tonight, hopefully, we can advance on that. Uh, and both uh, the Select Board and the Conservation Commission can look towards the potential features for that area. And that is one of the hopeful outcomes for tonight is to get both of those boards uh, in the same frame of mind for what might be acceptable for, for that area. Uh, the facilitators are arriving on the island later today. Uh, in fact, they'll be getting on a ferry in about um, 20 minutes. Um, so it will be the same format as before. Both boards be, um, having their conversation. There will be a public viewing gallery. It'll be on Zoom and recorded for it to be put online. Um, but it does not just need that to be fully understood. Um, and I'm sorry, Vince, that, uh, at least for me, the audio cut out right before you said something needs to be fully understood. <laughs> the, the meeting does not feature public comment. Does not feature public comment. Got it. Thank you. Ian? Yeah. Um, so there's there's been an open meeting law violation complaint filed. Uh, with the Attorney General on the format. And so, Matt, if you're listening, I think it'd be a help if Town Council could weigh in on the subject um, when we meet this afternoon. Thank you. I, I don't know if this is the right venue for that request. <laughs> um, well, you know, sure. It's I, been, yeah, it's no, public. I, you know, I, my understanding, he felt it was okay prior, and we had an email to that. To yeah, that th th regard. This, this is not the right place for that discussion, uh, gentlemen. I, I'm I'm sorry. I I think we're outside of our jurisdiction. Um, All right. Sorry, I appreciate Mary. Thank, thank you. Me, you know, it's the first I heard of it. I didn't know. Uh, okay. It. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, that is the upcoming meeting date and agenda. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So move. Thank you, Matt. Get a second. Second. Uh, was that Gary? Second. Uh, roll call no. vote. Gary Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Bill Borchard. Aye. Drew Brace. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Rachel Freeman. Aye. Ian Golding. Aye. Uh, and I guess uh, since Jen and Joanna have left, uh, it remains for me to say aye. Thank you all. Thank you.